So, again, it, it goes back to your brand. So if you can show the USPTO consumers identify this word with my brand and you have the receipts to back it up, then you can get it registered. And so when you when your attorney did your trademark for you guys, you had to show the USPTO specimen. I like to call it receipts, right, or, or proof of use. So you can't just file a trademark and get it registered just because you want to. Mm -hmm. You have to show them, hey, I'm using this in commerce. Them niggas scared to make that move. Can't relate to that. I roll the dice. Shit, if I lose, I'm gonna be shaking back. Cause lessons learned within the laws just elevate the fact that trial and error just the only way. Ain't no escaping that. I wake up, hit a hundred push ups, then I'm at my route. Check on my stocks, see how they looking, then I'm sliding out. When you start seeing your progression, you stop having doubts. And what's the point of having clout? You can't cash it out. True to this game, and number life, ayy. Hey. Feel like we finna change the cycle, ayy. Hey. That's the most success, you know we thriving, ayy. Hey. That's the most depression for our rivals, ayy. Hey. Could teach a lesson on survival, ayy. Hey. You know I'm from the bottom. What up with it, my wealthy people? It is your boy, David Bellard, one of the founders of Black Wealth Renaissance. Here with my brother from another Jalen. What's good with you, Clout? What's good with it, my brother? Man, stop telling my nickname to the world. Shit. Man, you done got about <laughs> six different nicknames on this motherfucker, man. <laughs> I know, man, but I'm doing great, dog. How you doing, man? Bro, I'm doing well, man. You already know. I'm doing actually. I'm doing better than well. I'm doing fantastic. I've been juicing my energies right. You know what I'm saying? I've been watching that the dude. Uh, what's the dude? The duties yeah. dude. Yeah, you got you got me all pumped up, man. But no, uh, I'm feeling good, bro. Mind's clear, ready to have an awesome conversation about some very important topics, especially coming into 2024 for business owners. Mm, yeah, I'm ready ready and excited for this as well. Indeed, I know this indeed. year is going to be very pivotal, especially if you're about to start new businesses, but uh, just in general, just to make sure that you have everything straight, everything situated, and I'm excited to have this episode yes, sir. Uh, coming yes, up. Sir. So, so look, 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 look before, before I get to introducing the guest, I already know what y'all got to do for your boy. Make sure you leave us that five-star rating and review. It. It helps us grow the show and get information out there to people who need it. Now, as promised, y'all, we got another fire episode for y'all today. We have a lovely young lady on from Chicago that is doing law out here in Dallas, Candice Chantel Patrick. She is the owner of Chantel Law, P PLCC, uh, PLLC. I'll be fucking it up, but <laughs> I'll be getting it right sometimes. You know what I'm saying? But listen, y'all, she's a business and contract attorney, and she's doing a damn thing out here in Dallas, so we have to bring her on so that we can have this conversation. Welcome, Candace, to the show. Yay! Thank y'all for having me. Thank you so much. Well, we gotta bring the on. claps back, yeah, man. man. I want, I want to hit. I need a lot of ambiance. You know, I got you. I got you. We're gonna, we're gonna get it together. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Candace. So I know I just gave like a super brief intro to you uh, for our audience listening. Can you just introduce them to yourself? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, Candace S. Patrick, most people know me on social media as Attorney Candace. Um, I handle business law primarily, but I do do a few different areas, uh, particularly divorces and personal injury. And I got into those areas because my business clients would start getting into trouble, needing divorces, getting into car accidents. So, I started helping them out. And that, that way, I expanded my law firm. Um, I'm from the south side of Chicago, graduated from Northern Illinois University College of Law. Um, and when it was time for me to take the bar, I decided I wanted to be somewhere warm. And so I kind of <laughs> mapped Smart. out. Came all down the, 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 <laughs> the side around here. Yeah, you made a good decision. Yeah, that I was, was like, lit. man, I'm not trying to be in a snowsuit going to court. I would rather be cute. So um, <laughs> I made the decision to move to the great state of Texas. Um, and Dallas won the fight between Dallas and Houston. A good, a good decision. I, yeah, I said, I'll go to Dallas. And um, I've been here ever since. And when I first got here... Um, I was trying to get into a major law firm, right? Because mm -hmm. in school, that's what they teach you, right? They're preparing you to go to major law firms. Um, and then all throughout law school, I work for the university's Office of General Counsel, which is a very prestigious position. So that's what I was looking for. Um, but when I came down here, I met my first legal mentor in, D in Dallas, and he kept encouraging me to start my own firm. Mm -hmm. So he kept saying, man, when I was your age, I started my own firm. Like, he just kept telling me to do it, right? And so um, 
uh, interesting story. Uh, it's probably not best for an introduction, but ask me about it later. So I basically got pushed into starting my own, own okay, law firm. Yeah, yeah, you so want me to talk yeah, about yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> like, why like, not? Well, well, talk I, really, I, I really was going to, you, you're touching on some stuff I was going to ask you. Okay. Because I thought you may have worked for a big firm first, but you went straight into your own I firm. I went straight in. Now, while I was in Chicago, I did work for some firms throughout Chicago, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like a major like uh, uh, employment. It was like through law school and like right after graduating, I was doing work helping out some firms. Mm-hmm. But as far as like moving to Texas where I'm licensed, I started working as like an independent contractor for a firm. And I was helping out kind of with like um, attorney bonds, right? So when people go to jail in Texas, you you guys know people can go to jail for anything. Mm-hmm. You get a speeding ticket and you don't go to court, they'll issue an, a warrant for your arrest. And so I was making decent money when I first moved here, just showing up and signing off on uh, attorney bonds for people to get out. And I knew that obviously that's not what I wanted to do. I just was trying to make some money and figure out my direction. Where where am I about to work? And at mm-hmm. the same time, I was interviewing for different law firms. So the story is this. The owner of that firm that I was doing the independent contracting work for, he wanted me to become a salaried employee. Mm -hmm. So he scheduled a meeting with me in his office, and I will never forget it. Um, It was him, and it was his assistant, who was an older white lady in the office. And he basically started talking to me and kind of talking down to me in a way because he was trying to prep me to accept his offer, right? And so... He had, he had never even looked at my resume or anything. Someone else hired me, right? So he didn't really do his research to know who he was talking to. And so at the end of his whole spiel, he's like, yeah, so I want you to be salary and not an independent contractor. So at that time, I knew I didn't want to do criminal law, even though my background all through law school was heavily focused on criminal law. I, I knew I didn't want to be at his firm. I was just trying to find my way because I didn't secure a job before coming to Texas. I just jumped out here, yeah, right? you just came here. So I'm like, I'm just doing this to get some experience, to kind of see what's going on and make money. And so anyways, I was open to his offer, and I said, okay, well, what do you propose? And so he was offering me 30000 a year. What? Huh? As a full salaried employee. What? And I was with a law degree? A law degree. Kiss my ass. This was 2018, guys. (laughs) That's my ass. 2018. That's insane. Insane. So imagine me with a law degree. With a law degree. But you have to understand at that time, he had one other black female attorney who was salaried, and he worked her crazy. Me, I was an independent contractor, so I only took the things the that I wanted to yeah. take, right? And so imagine me sitting in that office, a new attorney, newly licensed, and you have um, a man of another race sitting across from you telling you this. And at the time he was telling it to me, he was trying to belittle me. Mm-hmm. So he was like, you know well, what are your goals? What is it you want to do? And I said, well, I want to work with business owners. Um, I want to, you know, get into the entertainment. And he's like, oh, you'll never be able to get into entertainment. Little did he know I was already connected with high-level celebrities. Like, he didn't know who I was at that time. Mm. And so I was just sitting there listening to him, and I'm like, he's really trying to – I don't know if this worked with the other minority attorneys or Mm -hmm. what's – you know, I'm new to Texas, so I'm like, what is going on in Texas? Kind of like playing in your face on something. Yeah, I said I made over 30000 when I was in law school working for the Office of General Counsel. So needless to say, I rejected his offer, and – I Is told, that what pushed you to go ahead and start yeah. your own firm? Yeah, so I rejected his offer. I left the office that day. He texted me and said, hey, Candace, I really respect you. And then I went home that day, and I prayed, and I said, God, let me know when I need to go full force with my own law firm. Because I had already formed the company, but I hadn't, you know, you, when you start your own business, you're afraid, right? Mm-hmm. So I was still relying on the income from, from this firm, right? So I prayed. I said, God, let me know. Give me a sign when I should just go full force. By the end of that week, that was a Tuesday when I met with him. By the end of that week, that Friday, he told me if I was not going to do accept his offer, then I could not work as an independent contractor for him. Mm. And I was the happiest person. I was like, this is my sign. And the next month, I made 30000 that month Damn. at my firm. So you just started, like, independently? and went on my own, yep. Damn. So that's that was how I did it. That's, what, that's dope. That's dope. So, yeah. like, you... You didn't initially want to start your own firm, but whenever you mm-hmm. went ahead and did it, you were able to make 30 in that first month. That was the first right. month right. in your own firm. So, like, okay, now I'm I got I'm going somewhere different. Where were you getting clients from? <laughs> and it was crazy. So I always believed that, like, 
we have angels around us. We have, you know, God guiding us. And I feel like that was definitely my case mm-hmm. because here I was new to Texas. Um, I had some 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 friends of the family here that I knew, but I didn't have any like direct support here. Yeah. So what I would do is one, I would post a lot on social media. Mm-hmm. So it was new for me to start posting about um, business law and stuff like that on Facebook, Instagram. And then whenever I found an opportunity where I felt like my target audience would be, I would go. So for example, if there was some type of networking event, hosted by a sophisticated company, right? I would go to the networking event. If there, I remember, um, I think it's Dave Ramsey, Mm -hmm. uh, the guy for Shark Club, he hosted uh, uh, some type of event where he was trying to get people to join his team and stuff like that. And I thought to myself, business owners are going to be here, so I'm going. And sure enough, I was passing out my card, and people started calling me. And so that's how it happened. And then social media, people would just call me. People will start referring me. And then a lot of my friends and family back home in Chicago, they, I mean, from the moment I joined law school, before I could even practice, they were calling me. So I still <laughs> had them sending me business and stuff like that. And it just, it it just, just started out. developing. I yeah. I <laughs> and I, I never looked back. I do have a question. So you, you said in law school, you were primarily focused on criminal law, mm-hmm. but your desire was business and entertainment. Where did that come from and why did you choose to focus on criminal, but go the other way? Yeah, that's a good question. I knew you guys were going to follow up on that. So growing up for me, um, I made up my mind that I wanted to do criminal defense because I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and I have four brothers. So I was always seeing people involved in the criminal justice system to some degree. And then the attorney would be the person to save the day. So, for example, I had a very close childhood friend who got arrested for first-degree murder. And it almost broke my heart. But he had one of the top attorneys in Chicago. He paid him 50000 cash, but he got found not guilty, right? And mm-hmm. I was 16 when, when that happened. So for me growing up, I saw criminal defense attorneys as power, people who are coming to save the community, to save the day. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is I had no knowledge of the other areas of law. Just think about it. As, that was your exposure to yeah, law. Yeah, just think about our exposure growing yeah. up. You just think of law and order when you think about attorneys, right? Yeah. You don't really think about, like, business, entertainment. So that was my exposure. And so I was very passionate about it because I had that community connection. So when I went to law school, it was easy for me to, to ace criminal law, right? So, like, every criminal class I took, I aced it. Like, it was just natural for me to understand the law and to know how to navigate it. However, remember I was telling you earlier, your second and third year, you get to start Mm -hmm. picking your own classes. So second and third year, I wanted to be taught by two of the only black professors in the law school. One taught business law, one taught entertainment law, right? So in my mind, I'm like, I cannot graduate without saying I sat before these most honorable black distinguished professors. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And so even though I wasn't necessarily interested in business or entertainment per se, I just wanted the experience of them teaching me. And I fell in love with it. And not only did I fall in love with it, um, we have 60 to 100 students in each class. I got the highest grade on the exam for each of those classes. So that's how into it I was. Yeah, you was locked in. Yeah, I was like... To, for me to be taught by a black professor, and then we have very distinguished professors, you know, UCLA graduates, uh, New York law, uh, like just high level Harvard law professors. Mm-hmm. So it was an honor for me. So that second and third year when I took those two courses, it kind of started showing me another lens of how I could practice law. Then when I finally graduated, um, I got more um, experience handling my own criminal cases and so at that time, I was practicing in a city called Rockford in Illinois. I've actually heard of Rockford. You one heard of Rockford? Friends, one of our friends was a school there. Okay. And um, I felt like there was a huge uh, economic and racial imbalance in the criminal court system. Mm-hmm. So I kind of felt like regardless of how good I was as an attorney, there was, because you, you my, were always going to have to fight that bias. Yeah. It was like because my clients is – Black with tattoos all over his face, he's getting different treatment from the judge. Guilty. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so I told myself, you need to think long and hard about the future of your career. What do you want to do every single day? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want to be depressed. 
to a degree, criminal defense is kind of depressing I because can see you, that. you're dealing with people's livelihoods, mm-hmm. right? If you make one mistake or if if the if you get an all white jury or whatever well, the like case, you, said, you you put your all into it, and this person still gets the verdict that you don't want. That's depressing. Yeah. It's like damn, like I really gave this my all. I put what I could into it. And now it's nothing. Whereas like I could see on the business side. It's exciting. How it's a lot <laughs> more different. Yeah, too. it's like we're not dealing with you going to jail for a criminal offense. We're dealing with let's how we're gonna structure this deal, how we're gonna make something positive occur. Uh, yeah, I, I could see how that would help. Yeah. So that was my decision. Once I had that that ex- those experiences, and I really sat down and thought. I said, "Man, I would love to wake up every day and talk to business owners." And help them strategize on, you know, growing and protecting their businesses. And that's I what I did. <laughs> I love it. So now I kind of want to get into it. We talk about growing and protecting businesses. Yeah. Um, one of the buzzword topics that have been going on recently, uh, the Corporate Transparency Act. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's like, the Corporate Transparency Act, you got to watch out for it. We actually put out a blog on it uh, just to kind of clear out some things. But I would love to talk about it with you, right? Because that's something that is... It can be an actual concern for business owners if you're not aware of the the, the laws that are changing. So, like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong on anything. Uh, starting January first, twenty twenty four, any entity registered this year needs to register with FinCEN, right, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Mm-hmm. And if you're a business that was existing prior to then, we have until January first of twenty twenty five. Right. Uh, and but with new the, businesses, they have 90 days. Correct? 90 days, right. New businesses have 90 days. So from January 1st to March 30th, the 31st, that's when they got their time, right? Or March 30th, yeah. Time out, I just want to make sure. It's 90 days from the day that you were incorporated. incorporated right, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so that makes sense, yeah, because yeah. obviously. So if, you, a, so if a business incorporated yeah. January 1st, 2024, then yeah, your yeah. deadline in March would be correct. Gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah, and for the businesses that are already incorporated, like ours, yourself, we have until January 5th of 2025. Now, when it comes to the fines and stuff like that, that's where I see like it get kind of mm-hmm. wonky. Um, I've seen people say $10,000. I've seen people say $500 a day. Can we just kind of get into this whole corporate transparency? I can clear this shit up so that people can stop being like, oh, they coming yeah. for us, you know? Yeah. So I did a, I did a post about this as well, and, and I was more kind of like, jovial with people because I feel like people calm down calm down so it's another layer of uh protection for the federal government if you will against Mm -hmm. scammers and schemers and stuff like that trying to hide behind these different uh LLCs and stuff um so what up are you telling me the PPP loans is what spawned this you know it could be (laughs) right (laughs) It, it could be but the government just wants to know which for me, it's alarming because the federal government already has so much of our information. Mm-hmm. So the fact that people are still able to do so much uh, scheming and stuff like that to where they had to enact this act is is kind of alarming, right? Because mm-hmm. it's it the is. federal government. They have all like, of our information. Yeah, why, why are y'all asking for an additional report yeah. whenever we already got to file an <laughs> annual report? So we got some top-level schemers, I guess. Yeah. Um, That's kind of crazy. Now that you're making me think about it, because, like, uh, we file an annual report, and basically all the information you're putting on your annual report mm-hmm. is the same stuff that you're going to be reporting the fence in, right? Like, you're, it's, uh, I don't want to. But I think one is reported to Secretary of State yeah. versus this is but directly. Why they, can't call, why they can't talk internally? Yeah. So so I think that some people, you got to think about it, some, some people that are doing illegal stuff, they might create an entity, run up a bag, do some scheming, and then never do any uh, reporting to the Secretary of State. Mm. They might not be filing an annual report. Mm. They might not be filing taxes at all, right? So that's that's the gap that I feel like the IRS is trying to close, mm-hmm. where they're making us do this Corporate Transparency Act. But from my assessment of things, it's not that scary. All we're doing as owners of the company is disclosing to the to the federal government Hey, this is who I am. My address. This, you know what I mean. This is my ownership in the company. And so, as long as you're not doing anything illegal, you have nothing to worry about. Mm-hmm. And then they they're also giving you um, a nice amount of time. Mm-hmm. So for us who have already been incorporated prior to the new year, we have a whole year mm-hmm. to to disclose the information. And then the new companies, you have 90 days. So if you're doing it on your own, then that's just something else you add to the checklist. Okay, when I get done doing all of this, let me make sure I go over here to the federal government 
and tell them what they need to know. Or if you're working with someone like me, an attorney, or either, even your CPA, then you know your CPA is already going to be doing that for you. Or you can have the conversation with them like, hey, how much extra to do this or whatever. But to me, it's not that much to, to stress about. You don't go to jail or you don't get the fines and things like that unless you're not complying. And yeah. I don't see a reason why you wouldn't comply. Yeah, because yeah. they're not asking <laughs> for no crazy information or yeah. nothing like that. It's not like... They're gonna charge you ten thousand dollars today. Basically, for you to go to jail, you wouldn't have to file until like January of twenty twenty six. Well, just I mean, I think you could go to jail it for any non compliance, really. But I think the gov- federal government they do give you a lot of leeway. It's kind of like taxes. Yeah. If you do something illegal with your taxes, they're not gonna come get you the same day or yeah. the next day. That the federal government they wait. That interest yeah. run up on yeah. your ass. Yeah, they wait. Get, get four five years and then they pull up. Yeah, on you like, they they'll wait on you. I so. knew what you was doing. Exactly. Um, but the other thing that I found interesting uh, with this whole hysteria is that there's a lot of exemptions for the Corporate Transparency Act. So really? major corporations. Yeah. If you like at a certain threshold with employees mm-hmm. or if you got a certain, uh, I think it's revenue threshold, you got to. So it was a two prong test for that. Ex- so it's like 23 exemptions. So the one you're talking about is for like bigger businesses and they classify it as businesses who have more than 20 full time employees. And then um, their their taxes, it was a, a gross revenue of like five point five million or more, something in that area, but definitely five million or more. Um, and then, so that would be one exemption. I think right? another, yeah, another one was the, uh, if it's regulated by another body, is like SEC right. regulated and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's a lot of different exemptions. Um, nonprofits, for example. Uh, because they're already reporting to somebody. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, so it's a lot. Banks, yeah. um, different types of insurance companies. Yeah, banks companies. are going to be reporting to FINRA. Um, mm-hmm. they, they go into the SEC. That So that makes sense. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. But, like, the word you used to describe it was the best word, I think, so hysteria. far. The hysteria. Hysteria. Because, yeah. like, people, like, got so concerned, especially whenever you see $10,000, people are like, man, I, or I don't I think is it, is it two years up in jail? Or yeah, 10000 to two years in jail. And, you know, whenever you're marketing things, you're going to always put the, the highlight. You know right. what I'm saying? People go... People are always going to go, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Shit, I put it in your face. I want you to know the the big number so you're paying attention. But a lot of times you need to read those details so you're not hysterical and over here thinking, oh, my gosh, the world's going to end. No, the sky not falling, chicken little. Like, just just read a little bit. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And that that's another role that I play with my clients. So oftentimes in the business world, I get business owners coming to me who are hysterical about whatever the case is, whether it's a contract issue, somebody owes them some money or somebody using their trademark, whatever it is, they're usually hysterical. So as a business attorney, I have to stay cool, calm and collected and just kind of like calm down. It's okay. Like, yeah, it might be a little trouble there, but this is, these are our, our, our options, A, B, C, or D. How do you want to go about it? You know what I mean? So that's kind of the approach that I took with the act on my platform, just letting people know, like, yeah, it's a new requirement for us as business owners, but it's as long as you give them their information, it's it's nothing to worry about. I like it. Right? I like <laughs> like, it. Yeah. It's simple. It, 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 don't make it complicated. Just report yeah. to the people. And again, that the people that we got to report to is FinCEN, right. uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. I think the little thing is F-I-N-C-E-N. You got a good memory. I, yeah. Yeah, I have one more question. Do we have to file this report annually or is this a one-time thing? Um, I f- it's 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 a one time thing, but if like the ownership changed, then, then you'll you don't need to, to add more information. It. Okay, because the gotcha. the biggest thing is they want to know who's behind the company. Mm-hmm. So remember, the whole purpose of the LLC corporation or whatever is kind of to shield you as a human Individual. being, right, as the you. owner, right. And so a lot of the different states allow us to do that in a very oh, good like way. Like Delaware and those types Wyoming, of states, yeah. right? Well, you have anonymous members. So like in Texas. You have to list either the members or the managers, right? So to a degree, you're exposing some of the owners, right? But those other other states, you can get away with not putting anything. Mm-hmm. So let's say you guys get another owner and you give him fifty percent ownership or something. Of course, then he would need to disclose that to the, to the federal yeah. government. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, then kind of like an addendum to it that you just have to uh, change right. and update. Okay. Same so like you change the secretary of state, just make sure you're updating that as well. Right. I like how you said it, though. It's just another step on your checklist that you need to uh, add whenever you're forming your business or 
doing any of your uh, legal requirements. Mm-hmm. So it's not. It doesn't sound any that much, that scary right now that uh, we talk about I mean, it. Shit, that's it. Sound pretty <laughs> simple. Sound like I just got to go to a website and put my information in. Yeah. Um, but I guess the whenever you were mentioning that losing that um that protection in a sense for those people with those Delaware LLCs and things like that uh with this the information that we're reporting to FinCEN is this going to be like public database type stuff? Like, can anybody look at this or is this confidential? Now, the federal government can always change it. But as it stands right now, from my research, it is not public record. Okay. Right? So, so it's like, just for the federal government. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. It could sense still then. be anonymous. Yeah. Basically, because, like, I don't know, I look on sites like Open Corporates or something like that where mm-hmm. you can go in and find who owns the LLC, but those Delaware LLCs, yeah, you can't. Yeah, we be checking. So if you could go and, yeah, we be, yeah, we be looking. We be checking. Don't be trying to scam We know your real name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. That's an inside joke. Uh, but, no, that that's that's important. And it's good to know that FinCEN's information won't just be publicly plastered to you still have that level of protection from an LLC because some people, they started jumping into like, oh, you need to go get a trust immediately. And it's like, that's not necessarily Y'all going true. zero to 100 real quick. Well, yeah. I, as an attorney, I always recommend the trust just because it gives you the extra layer of um, protection. Mm-hmm. And I'll explain the, the protection thing in a minute. And then also um, the the anonym, anonymity, right? Mm-hmm. So I always recommend the trust as well. Um, especially for those companies who are grossing larger revenues because Mm -hmm. then you have more to lose. So when we think about the simple entities like the LLC and corporation, we get those to protect ourselves, right, Mm -hmm. and protect our own assets. Well, the trust is going to make it harder for an attorney like me to figure out who you are and sue you, and it's kind of a deterrent, right? So, for example, earlier last year, I was going after this big real estate company in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Um, they had did some shady things to one of my clients. And I, and I typically don't get into the uh, representation of tenants per se. Mm-hmm. But sometimes other attorneys will refer me certain things. And it might be a case where I really want to help someone that's having a hard time. And, man, it... it I'm an attorney, and it took me a long, long, long time to try to figure out who these people were. Like who the beneficial owners of the trust are? You need to know who they are to list them in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're they're layered. So it might be a corporation that owns, you know, A, B, C, and D, and then a trust owns all of it. And then trust, the information for the trust is not necessarily public, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to make it public knowledge who owns the trust. Like, so uh, let me just make sure I'm getting this right. So, like... Where I should say I could go on open corporates, look up LLC, and I can find everybody that owns it. You're right. saying for a trust, that's not the same situation. Nope. Like, if a trust is owned by a corporation, how would I find out that the trust is owned by a corporation? That's like with the, that's when y'all get in y'all attorney yeah. bag and do y'all, yeah. y'all researching? So, for example, I might go on to um, Dallas County Property Search, and mm-hmm. then I'll start being able to see, like, okay, I can kind of do like a a paper trail. Okay, so if this is the property who did the wrongdoing, this is is listed on the Dallas County property search, this is the people who own it, and then I kind of can go from there, right? Correct me if I'm uh, wrong. A trust is its own entity, and it actually has what? Is it beneficiaries that the trust have, correct? Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't have to disclose who's... It's a whole other realm, a whole other ball game. It's not in the same... like. LLCs, corps, all this trust over here, right? right? Not like together in the same umbrella. Exactly. Got you, right. got you. So yeah. kind of getting into some of the stuff, like this is good stuff that we're talking about right here. Uh, I want to talk about intellectual property. I think oh, intellectual cool. property is always a big conversation. We, Whenever we ran into each other at Flex's event, shout out to Flex, good guy here in Dallas. We got to get Flex on one day. We bro. do need to get Flex on um, we were talking about intellectual property and I think that's always a relevant conversation in our community because a lot of times we don't talk about it enough, but this is our greatest asset. A lot of times the properties and the things that we create. Uh, So just to kind of kick it off, I want to clear up some of the confusion with the differences between copyrights and trademarks and patents. Like, so can we get into like, what's the difference between copyrights, trademarks and patents? Cause like, they each offer you legal protection, right? But they mm-hmm. do it in a different, different way. ways, yeah. Yeah. So I have a famous example that I always use. Um, 
But the term intellectual property itself, just view that as like an umbrella word, right? So mm-hmm. under that umbrella, we have copyright, copyrights, trademarks, and patents, okay? Mm-hmm. So when you hear people say, oh, my intellectual property, it could be any of those three. Just in general, the intellectual property that you develop from your mind. So you have the um, uh, copyrights, which is like your creative works, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is the book writing. It is what we're doing right now, the podcasting. It's anything that's like a creative work, right? Um, it's the music. The composer. music. Yeah, it's, it's the singing of the music. It's the writing of the music, the mm-hmm. lyrics. It's all of those creative works. If you created okay? it, you have a copyright. Right, like so, it's artistic works. Mm-hmm. That's what you want to, you know, deal with for your copyright. It even gets down to artwork. So maybe your logo, things like that. Anything that's this in any way artistic is going to fall in the realm of copyright protection. Mm-hmm. Now, the example that I like to use is um, the flying car. It's ironic. Last year, I saw that they they actually came out with the flying car. I've been using this example for like six, seven years, right? Mm-hmm. Because I like aviation. So in my free time, I go and fly. But right now, I don't like, own a... you going to be a pilot? Type not that I'm going to be a pilot, but... Well, maybe. That's hard. We'll, we'll, we'll fit that. We'll yeah. that later. That's hard, though. <laughs> well, I'll accept your manifestation for me. I might get my pilot's license. But right now, it's just something I do for fun. Mm-hmm. So in Addison, they have private airports. You can go and fly the little Cessna planes. So in my free time, when I want some extra fun and adrenaline, I go and do that. So you go fly them shits. I go fly. Yeah. I got videos on my social media. I go fly. Yeah. Um, Look up your lawyer in the sky, baby. (laughs) (laughs) So my example that I always use to break it down um, is let's say there's a, a, a new invention. You got a vehicle. Um, and then that vehicle starts to fly. Let's say to market the vi- the the vehicle, they create some type of infomercial or commercial, and they got singing, they got all this artistic stuff. We would copyright the commercial, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now the next category is the trademark. The trademark is going to protect your brand. So your brand is anything that consumers use to identify your business. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be your logo, your business names, even your colors, right? Even your slogans. So if you have particular slogans you use before you start your podcast that everybody identifies with your company, then that's going to be trademarked, mm-hmm. right? Can you trademark a jingle? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, no, no, no. You, you would copy. be copyright. You would, you would copyright a jingle, but let's say it's a particular part of the jingle that you use every time you start your podcast or every time you go on live and it somehow become identified with your business, then yeah, we would trademark gotcha. it. Like how Sony has, like when you cut on their products, that little whom noise, that yeah. type of joint. Well, like, you know, you got ba da ba 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 right? I'm gotcha. loving it. You know? Um, so with the flying car, let's say we named it Chantel's Flying Car, right? Mm-hmm. It's simple, but if that's the name of the car, then we would trademark that because that's how people is, are going to identify the flying car. Okay, and then the most important part with this particular invention, a flying car, that's crazy, right? So we want to make sure that we own the engineering that it took to create the flying car, and that's where the patent comes in. Mm -hmm. So any inventions you create, right, you want to get a patent over it. So let's Mm -hmm. say we come up with a a, a robotic vacuum, which they already have, but let's say it's a a big human-like vacuum. It'll come vacuum your house. That's a new invention, Mm -hmm. so we want to get a patent on that. That's kind of how you break it down. You what saying a flying car made me think about the yeah. Jetsons, like the little robot from the Jetsons. She <laughs> like, right, right, cleaning but the house. they created yeah. it, though. Yeah. I saw it last year for the first time on Instagram. They were, like, marketing the flying car. That's dope. And That's I was dope. like, man. It's supposed to be flying taxis coming to Dallas. Uh, with Bro, I'm not ready for that. Years. I'm not going to I mean, <laughs> ready or not, it don't matter. Like, Whoa, that's crazy. It's coming. It's coming. Ready. That's if you're ready man. on that, That's you probably not the target artist right now. I'm not. I'm not. I know you're not. crazy. I definitely would buy one. I know you I feel would. Like I helped them manifest. She it. gonna be in the taxi <laughs> like, yo, I'm pulling up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm landing on the rooftop right now, girl. <laughs> Going to the moon, I'll be back. That's but crazy. I do want to ask. So, like, who are the agencies you're reporting to on those particular things? Like with copyright, do you actually report copyrights, or once it's created, it's protected? So that's a great question. So the agencies, when it comes to trademarks and patents, it's the USPTO. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? So we're very familiar with them. But then as far as copyrights, they have their own unique system. So it's the U.S. Copyright Office. That's mm-hmm. the website you would go to. Gotcha. And as far as protection, so it's tricky. When it comes to copyrights, 
uh, the copyright is technically created the moment you put it in what we call tangible medium of expression, right? Okay. So all that means is you kind of um, document it in some way. So the moment we do this recording, this podcast, it's effectively a copyright over it. Mm -hmm. Is it because we're recording it? So the recording of it is a tangible medium of expression. Okay. But if we were just in the bathroom talking, that it wouldn't be a tangible medium of expression because there's no way to go back and, and document it. Mm -hmm. If we wrote out some music lyrics, us writing out the lyrics would be a tangible medium of expression. Okay. Gotcha. But for example, let's say a comedian, a comedian just getting up there freestyling and in that moment creating jokes. That's not a tangible medium of expression. Now, if it's a videographer in the back recording the stand up, then it would be a tangible medium of expression. So in those moments, when you have that tangible medium of expression, the copyright is effectively created. But the only problem is you cannot sue someone for infringing on your copyright unless you have an actual federal registration for the copyright. Mm, okay. You see what I mean? That's important because I've always, my understanding has always been copyrights are inherent. You don't have to file them. But if you don't file it, you're saying you can't get you can't actually sue nobody. Right. Can't enforce it. Right. So the courts are actually going to make you file the copyright registration first. Mm -hmm. Then you can sue. And then another downside is if you did not have a registered copyright at the moment the infringement happened, you don't get some of the statutory protections. So for example, the statute says if you infringe on someone's copyright, you have to pay their attorney fees. And then there's other like statutory fines. But if you didn't have a valid registered copyright in the uh, 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 federal database at that time, then mm -hmm. you don't get those statutory protections. And it's no backdoor? Like if I registered it today and sued you for an offense two years ago, they wouldn't? It would no, no you have to, at the, at the time of the infringement, it has to have been registered, right? So the courts are going to honor, hey, on this day, you put it in a tangible medium of expression so we can identify that you did create it. You are the creator, but you didn't have it registered. So they're going to force you to go and register it first, and then you'll be able to sue, and then you're going to lose out on some of those statutory damages, and you will only be allowed to get, like, your actual damages. Gotcha. So, like, what did you actually suffer as a result of this person infringing on your copyright? Mm, that makes okay. And then you're going to come out of pocket paying for your own attorney to represent you and stuff like that. So my suggestion is always, obviously, put it in a tangible medium of expression, but also go ahead and, and copyright it. Does it cost to copyright it? Do I have to pay like five, ten, twenty, thirty dollars every time I copyright something? Like it, register? It does cost. It's a filing fee. Uh last year it was about sixty bucks okay. to file. But I mean sixty bucks so. and you legally own something. So like we were talking about my daughter's book earlier. Mm -hmm. That's copywriting. Yeah. I mean, I could have just been like, it's just a book, uh, you know, but it's it's copywritten. She owns that book. That's got hers. illustrations in that book, too. Nice illustrations. <laughs> I know y'all had that commission. You, you ain't got to say it nicely. I already know. That was nice. I see it. Yeah. So that's how you want to handle uh, copyrights. And then that's a really big issue right now. Um, I was seeing the the viral videos with uh, Shannon Sharp and uh, oh, Cat Williams. Cat, yeah, yeah. With, with people stealing jokes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, every other uh, creative industry, the, the musicians, um, actors, actresses, they they have gotten to the point where they strongly protect their work, right? But the comedians have not really leveled up yet. So from my legal perspective, what I would suggest to comedians is start copywriting your jokes, okay? Like because act, once, once you, you put it on video, actually going to the U.S. Not just video. You can write down. You can physically I, write it down, Yeah, right? so, so a lot of comedians handwrite their jokes first, mm -hmm. um, and then they go, you know, like they practice, right? Now, some of them are doing just freestyle. Improv. Obviously, that's a risk when you just freestyle. But if you're writing out your jokes, it's, it's no reason not to just say, hey, Candace, can you copyright this for me, you know, or even go on there yourself, you know, if you feel comfortable, comfortable doing that. But every time you're writing out your jokes, I would, I would copyright my jokes. So that way... If I saw another person using my jokes, well, now I'm going to teach you a lesson because this is a registered uh, copyright. So now you owe me some money. So whatever money that you made off of that show using my jokes, now I have some type of claim to that money. Mm. And you got to pay my attorney fees. Right. You see how it works? <laughs> I ain't going to lie because when, whenever I, we were planning for this, my question was like, damn, 
Would you go broke just like filing all of these lawsuits for people using your copyright? But if you register and you got to pay attorney fee, they got to pay attorney fees. That's a win win all day. Yeah. And in that cat, in the case of Cat Williams, like you had mentioned, he's he said it a few times. Like this was a televised joke, so that would be a tangible medium of expression. So where like even if he didn't file it right, any money that Cedric made off of selling that joke, like you were just saying, he could like say if he did it live at a show. Would he have claim to the revenues from that show? So, so it gets really tricky with breaking down the actual um, infringement, right? Mm-hmm. So on the surface, yes, he could file a suit once he go went and registered it, right? So let's say he did the stand up, you know, uh, you said he he video recorded yeah, it. Yeah, I think something. he said twenty eighteen or something like that is when he recorded it. Okay, so if it's video recorded, that's effectively a tangible medium of expression. Mm-hmm. But did he go and actually get a, a copyright for it? Mm-hmm. So then that that would be a hurdle for him. So now you're gonna have to go and get a copyright for it, and then there's a second layer. the The videographer actually owns owns that material. Ooh, so Cat good. owns what he what the, the jokes he said, but whoever is recording it, that's that's the person that owns that material, mm-hmm. right? So it w- it would be a few hurdles for him. But yes, if he wanted to, he could dot his eyes and cross his t's, get the copyright registration. And then still take action, but would it be really worth his time? Probably Maybe not, not just yeah. because it's, it's you got to go back a little bit too much. And so another thing too with filing those copyright infringement suits or any uh, intellectual property infringement, you want to make sure that you're going after some defendants that have money, because we don't want to, like, yeah, I can get you a W, I can I can get you a win, of course, but then you're gonna be looking at me sad if it's like they can't pay the judgment, you know. <laughs> Because somebody going to pay me for my time. Yeah, like, right. you went through all this trouble just to say that they they were liable, but then they ain't got nothing to pay you with. Right. Yeah. So that's just things to keep in mind, but that's a great question. So what about, like, trademarks then? How do you uh, enforce those? Like, is it the same process? So you still would file a, a suit, right, right, in federal court. Everything is federal when it comes to intellectual property. You still would file a suit, but trademark... It's a little fun because let's say somebody's, <laughs> yeah, I love trademarks. It's fun in the sense that let's say someone is infringing on your trademark because they went and filed their own trademark registration, mm-hmm. right? You can do a number of different things. While it's in the process of being reviewed by the USPTO, you can file what's called an opposition. And if you file an opposition and win, you can get their trademark application knocked down so it won't get approved, okay? And then let's say... You're snoozing. You're not really checking the USPTO regularly, so you don't know who's filing something every day. But let's say you find out someone has pretty much copied your brand and somehow it it got past the USPTO and got registered as an actual trademark. Mm-hmm. Instead of filing the opposition, because at this point it's registered, you would do a cancellation proceeding to cancel the entire registration. So it, it flows like a lawsuit. But it's under the body of the US of the of the USPTO, mm-hmm. right? Gotcha. It's really the uh, uh, US uh, USPTO. They have another layer, like the trial and um, appeals board or whatever. But that's how you would handle the the trademarks. And so it gets pretty interesting because you have all these different tools with the trademarks to kind of protect your brand, if you will. Mm-hmm. But the first layer of business that I always like to tell people is you want to send out the cease and desist because mm-hmm. it's, it's going to be much cheaper. For your attorney to send a piece of paper to someone to say, like "Hey, a little warning shot, like, yeah, hey, <laughs> like, stop using my ass. brand, <laughs> and if you don't, then I'm gonna sue you." So that's always fun because most people um, are afraid when they get a letter from from an attorney. Yeah, it's like, oh, dang, what's this? You know, it's like a letter. Attorneys in the IRS. That's two letters you don't want to get. <laughs> yeah, so that's how you would enforce the trademark, and then the patents would be the same way. So I, in particular, don't handle patents. That's a different specialty. Mm-hmm. And it requires uh, different certifications and stuff like that for attorneys. Um, but I know enough about patents to say that, yeah, you will handle it in a, in a similar way with gotcha, protecting gotcha, it. Gotcha. You mentioned something in there, Candace, whenever you were talking about uh, the videographer. Uh-huh. And it brought, it brought something that I want to talk up about. Uh, when it comes to content like that, right, the person behind the camera, they typically own the content unless there's some type of work for hire. Mm-hmm. Um But I wanted to get into the whole name, image, and likeness side of things, right? Because one deal that had came up recently was the thing with Cameron. I'm not sure if you guys saw that. 
Uh, oh, when they took the picture of him yeah, in that so pretty pink. Yeah, Cam got, got the picture of him in the pink hoodie and uh, the pink mint coat. And he's been selling it on merch of his for years. And last year he lost a lawsuit um, behind that, actually, because the person that took the photo never signed off on it. And I think they said they attempted to send him letters and stuff like that, but he never did respond. And I, I seen another situation where it was Nas as well. Uh, a photographer took a picture of Nas, and he took a picture of Nas, Tupac, and some people. And Nas posted it on his Instagram, and the attorney, I mean the uh, the photographer, sued him for that as well. So my my question on that is like, if it's your name, image, and likeness, and some of these things, do you have a legal right to these things at, in any capacity, even if you didn't take the picture? So it depends, but but typically no. So we're like the situations that you recommend that you just mentioned. Um, they didn't win the case because it wasn't necessarily commercial appropriation of their their name, image, and likeness, right? So if you're walking out in public, anybody has the ability to just snap a picture of you. Now, if they start capitalizing off of that picture and you know they're soliciting it as if like. This is this is Cameron. I took this picture and, and and just making a ton of money off of it. Then you might have a claim to it, but just a person taking a picture by in and of itself, that's it's really not going to meet the legal requirements for a commercial appropriation. What would be more so a cr- commercial appropriation is if like, um, someone started doing a podcast and they kept mentioning, yeah, Attorney Candace, she loves our podcast. She. Uh, she said our podcast was was better than someone else's. She supports our and they start using my name so or say Beyonce. Yeah. Beyonce would be better. Oh, Beyonce approved of our stuff or Beyonce likes our perfume or whatever. And then they're making money off of, of that person's name. Then that's different. Then you have a stronger claim. But just going out in public and somebody taking a picture of you. Unfortunately, you really don't have have that many yeah. rights. So even like cause that camera situation, it kind of blew my mind. It was like. Damn, it's a picture of him, so he can't sell a picture of him, even because he didn't take the picture, and I guess because he didn't have anything in place with the photographer at the time. Yeah, uh, and like I think I seen that. I was reading into the case. I believe the photographer had had sent some notices like several times, like, "Hey, yo, you got to stop selling this shit." And it was a situation where it wasn't responded to. Is it? Is that something that like whenever they say that? You're, you're delivering these things. Is this something you got to get served, like papers you got to get served, or is it just by mail notice? Is that fine? So it depends. Like, if you're serving a lawsuit or something like that, then, yes, you have to physically get it served mm-hmm. to the person. Gotcha. But just like a regular cease and desist or just a notice of intent to sue, you can just send that to the person's address or even via email these days. You can just email it to a person. Yeah, so I ain't thinking about I, I was thinking, like, maybe they have to physically, like, you know, somebody told him and he was like, Nah, fuck it. You know, I'm just gonna keep selling my stuff. It could have just been a situation where this was sent via email or mail, and it never was received. He he probably got the before notice. the lawsuit got. Yeah, there. yeah. He, he probably got the notice. I mean, I'm assuming the photographer's attorney did their due diligence to figure out who who this individual is. Um, I'm sure as a as a rapper, I'm sure he has his own attorney and legal representation. So I'm sure there was some 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 communications before the lawsuit. And then another thing is once a lawsuit is served, you have an opportunity to settle. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to necessarily go go through trial go through trial and take the chance of winning or losing. You can settle with the person. So I think in this case, um, the artist Cameron, he probably was just very frustrated about the situation and the laws. And sometimes the laws are not in our favor, mm-hmm. but they are what they are. And then you have to think about it. Uh, a lot of the people creating the laws, the the justices on the Supreme Court, um, they're a bit up in age. They're older. So in their generation, when, when the copyright laws and stuff like that were really, you know, being litigated about, it was it wasn't so much the new age technology they had that we all this have digital stuff like we had. Yeah, so think about it. Photographers had a lot of protections. Photographers were very popular back then. I mean, they're popular now, but I'm just saying back then they you held. They had to have the camera. Like everybody has a like yeah. camera film. Now. Yeah, so that, that it holds a lot of weight, is what I'm saying, right? Um, and then I would compare a photographer to like an artist. So if an artist sat down at his desk and they drew their own picture. 
just because this is a picture of Tupac doesn't mean that you own it. Like, I sat down and I drew it, right? Now, if they drew a picture of another picture of Tupac, then that would be different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if they somebody just, already drew this and you yeah. just recreated it. But if they just in their mind, okay, I remember what Tupac looks like. I'm going to draw him and sketch him or paint him or whatever. They own that. That's their artistic work. So it's, it's unfortunate sometimes, but that's just how it is. So if, if it was my client, what I would have done in a situation would say, let's, because you like this picture so much, let's sit down and negotiate um, with the artist, right, the photographer, and purchase the picture mm. because it's more valuable to you. You want to use it on your, your whatever he was using it on. And then that's you what we that did. He on everything. He's putting yeah. that shit on there. He had shirts. He had jackets. <laughs> nigga had socks. Yeah. Then you're selling wristbands. Like, come on, bro. You're doing too much. <laughs> yeah. So he should have, the smart thing that I would have said to my client, and, and that's where being a, a business attorney comes into play. It's not always pretty when I sit down with my clients and, and kind of consult with them, but I have to give them the real deal. So I would have said, A, we can negotiate a settlement, right? And then we would have started talking numbers. What's the most you're willing to pay for this, right? What are you willing to give up? Maybe he's just a fan. Maybe he just want to go to dinner with you and he'll give you a picture. Maybe whatever. So we'll start talking about what are you willing to give up in exchange for this photo, right? Then I could send an offer letter. Well, let me back up a little bit. So that'd be option A. Option B would be you, we can we can file a lawsuit, try to get some type of declaratory judgment as to who owns this or whatever, but you're going to have to pay me, mm-hmm. and the money you're paying me, we could have been using that to settle and, mm-hmm. and purchase the, the photo. Or we could just do nothing, and you keep doing whatever you're doing, and you run the risk of being sued, right? Mm-hmm. So then I kind of let my client say... Okay, Candace, I'm going to do option A, right? And then if we went with option A and tried to settle, then I'd send an offer letter, and we would go back and forth a little bit with um, with the other attorney and try to get a, a deal a deal resolved. That's how it works, yeah. Damn, Cam, should have been a little bit of <laughs> diplomatic, <laughs> man. Oh, that was <laughs> – you're, you're funny, bro. <laughs> but that's good, Candace. I appreciate that. that. That's a very good breakdown on that, and I got a much better understanding of it now because I was just, like, thinking, uh, like, damn, man, I just – it didn't make no sense to me, like sense. especially the Nas one. The Nas case, I did, I did look into like the court docs. I believe that one got dismissed. Okay. Um, with with nothing, I think it was voluntarily dismissed, is what I read by the photographer. Because I didn't see how they could make a claim to that one. You know, it's like, bro, he didn't even make no money off of this. He just posted yeah. this on Instagram. Like, mm-hmm. if you can get sued behind posting a picture on Instagram, that's kind of crazy. Sound like some hating shit. Right yeah. Now. And money then you got grab. exceptions to copyright infringement also. So you have something like fair use, right? Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, legal, uh, not legal, but just commentary in general on someone's work, um, like something educational, things like that are exceptions to copyright infringement. So I'm pretty sure I didn't so read the can case. Can you give me an example? Like what you mean, like something educational? How is that? It? Yeah. Like a reaction video on YouTube? Exactly. So, for yeah. example, with gotcha. me as an attorney, um, I kind of uh, uh, leveraged viral videos and I talked about the the, edu- the educational legal piece of it, right? So, I remember I started going viral on TikTok because I did a, a reaction a commentary on an Uber driver who exposed a, a cheating husband. And I was oh, being shit. funny, right? But I was just like, well, if it was my client, I'm suing you for this, 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 and this, right? Um, And then she tried to challenge it on a copyright basis. But it's not copyright infringement. It's fair use, right? Because I'm giving legal commentary. It's not like I'm posting this video on my website and I'm using this as a basis to to get money or something like that. No, I'm giving legal commentary and feedback. I'm educating people. So that's an exemption. So I didn't the fair use. Fair use, right. So I didn't read the, the lawsuit for Nas, but I'm assuming I'm pretty sure his lawyer probably made that argument. Just posting one picture, probably, you know, that would fall under like just fair use, like and that's what protects most of us on social media. Because exactly. I mean most people, let's just be honest here, guys. Whenever you look at something, you go to Google, you find it, you crop it, you do what you do, and then you make your content a lot of times. Yeah. So like that's what protects us in that sense. Yeah, but you gotta be careful with like the going to Google and cropping and taking pictures because that would be copyright infringement depending on how you use it. So if you're giving, like, feedback on something that somebody else created, um, if you're doing, like, a what we call a parody, so if you're making fun of somebody's content or something, you know how you see the, the funny uh, content creators where they're, like, they might... Entrepreneurs be, like, take, on a podcast. Take a, yeah. song, take a song and make it funny. Exactly. So then... 
that would be fair use. But let's say you go on Google and you say, man, I want to make me a new flyer for my business and I need some purple flowers. And you go on Google and you search purple flowers and then you find all these pictures and you find the one you like. But let's say John, the photographer, took this picture Mm -hmm. and he knows that's his picture and he sees it on your flyer. Technically, that's copyright infringement because you're. I could hit you with that. Yeah, that's not an educational basis. You put it on your flyer. You're trying to solicit business. You know what I mean? So, it, it can get very tricky. So, I be careful. With okay, the, I appreciate with that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Google. got it here first. You heard me? Content creators. I, so I I do since we're like on the content. I know you just said you know a lot of the people who created some of these this litigation is older. How do you see? this changing for the digital environment do you see the laws being updated any push like that man it's crazy so last year we had a crazy case um it was a breach of contract case and the defendant was arguing so basically it's two farmers right they had done business in the past and they didn't use a a formal written contract they were just a type agreement Right, but they would text each other and say, yo, I got the however many barrels of corn at 16, whatever. And then the other person would either heart the message or wink or whatever. And that's what they did in the past, right? And so this one particular instance, the defendant sent like a um, thumbs up emoji. But then he didn't honor the contract. Mm -hmm. So the farmer sued for breach of contract. And so the defendant was arguing, I just sent the thumbs up emoji. That wasn't me accepting the agreement, right? But this was the standard y'all said already, right? That's so you said, look, you could be a lawyer. So <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm following your train of thought. So, oh. so that would be prior course of performance. So court, the court looked at that, right? But the point I'm trying to get at is how in this new age, we're using emojis, emojis yeah. right? So the court said that emoji was, a, was good enough to constitute acceptance of the mm-hmm. offer that the farmer made. So, therefore, it was a binding contract. Mm. So, as we progress in this, this you know, tech world or whatever, I foresee more stuff like that happening. Mm, that's, that's cool. So, that sets precedences, and yeah. you start using that moving forward. Right. So, just in general, when, when I read that case, for me, advising my clients, it's like, be careful what you put in the text messages. Obviously, we know, be careful what you say in person because verbal agreements are valid. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you got to be careful. Don't heart somebody's message if it's if it's like a proposition or something like that. You know, you just have to be very clear so that there is uh, a meeting of the minds, if you will, as to what the agreement is, if you accepted it, if you did not, things like that. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, what you got, Dave? I, I wanted to ask a bit more no about some of the trademark stuff, okay. actually. So, because I wanted to, we are gonna get into contracts too, because that's a very important topic. But uh, with trademarks, I wanted to get into a, a few things, right? Okay. So right now, the USPTO is backed up, right? I think when we oh, spoke, man. you said it's like <laughs> eighteen months, if not it's more. It's a long what? time. It yeah, it took us a long time. time. Yeah, it, it took us a long time. We filed a few years ago. And I saw, like, a, a stat. I think it said, like, the amount of trademarks filed since 2020, that like, it tripled, mm-hmm. like, from the, the previous period. Uh, so with filing a trademark, it's going to take some time. Mm-hmm, That's something that, like, we, we need people to understand. But when you're filing a trademark, one thing I wanted to clear up is, does this cover you? Because I know you said it's for brands, right? It doesn't cover your brand in every aspect whenever you trademark. Yeah. It only covers you in a certain place. Right. Can you kind of talk about that, like explain how that works? Absolutely. So, A, yes, it is extremely backed up. You know, I have to keep my clients from jumping off the ledge all the time because they're <laughs> like, where is the candidate? I'm like, you know, I can, if I could just walk into the USPTO's office and, like, threaten them to get it, you know, done quicker, I would, but I can't do that. So, anyways, yeah, it does take a long time, so I'm glad you guys already have the understanding. I'm sure your your attorneys thank you. And then, um, B, there's different uh, categories of... I ain't had that understanding at first. I ain't gonna lie. I was mad. I was mad. I was mad. I was like, but why the hell is taking so long? I, I had understanding. Yeah. I was like, bro. You just had to be patient. I kept asking. I was like, bro, where the trademark at? I, go, I got to the point where I forgot we even filed that shit. That shit just came out. I said, oh, shit, it's him. That's how it works. It just pop up in the email. Okay, it's registered. It's like, yay. Um, But as far as the different classes that you were referring to, there are about 45 different classes for the trademark. Okay. And what that means is like, like I looked you guys' trademark up 
And you guys have a trademark in the class of education and entertainment, which is class 41. So you are protected. I like her. She do research. I like that shit too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make sure we on our shit, goddamn. All right, I'm going to get you right. So you guys are protected in class 41. So education and entertainment, that means other podcasters. That means other people on social media. Anything in education and entertainment, even if they're on TV, it doesn't matter. You guys own your trademark in class 41. But let's Cease say. Cease assist that ass. Right. But let's say someone used your trademark for cosmetics. You don't own the yeah, trademark cosmetics. we don't cosmetics. own cosmetics. So you can't say they're infringing on you. Mm. Right? You got to go change that. Right. <laughs> but then you, you, got, you gotta, niggas but, ammunition. But then, like, that's the thing, though, right? Because what you're saying, that's not what our business is known for, though. Like, so if they Black Wealth Renaissance in, in that, would they be able to use our logo and all that shit like that? So with the logo... I always recommend copywriting the logo because remember it's it's a form of art. Mm -hmm. So copyrights will protect your artwork. So if you have a logo, copyright it. That okay. way, regardless of what trademark category they're trying to apply for, you can say even though I'm not using cosmetics for Black Wealth Renaissance, I have the logo That's copyrighted. So mm -hmm. if they wanted to just use the plain words Black Wealth Renaissance, you can't do anything about that. But if they actually copied your logo for co the cosmetic category, you own the copyright. So now you could win that way, right? I'm glad you said words because I know big corporations are copywriting words. How yeah. the fuck does that work? So Facebook it, owned the word face. That, that was insane when I heard it. Like, how you own the word face? You ain't made faces up. They probably trademarked it. Yeah, like, I'm sorry, not copyrighting. They're trademarked. Yeah. How does that work? So, again, it, it goes back to your brand. So, if you can show the USPTO consumers identify this word with my brand and you have the receipts to back it up, then you can get it registered. And so, when, you, when your attorney did your trademark for you guys, you had to show the USPTO specimen. I like to call it receipts, right, or, mm -hmm. or proof of use. So, you can't just file a trademark and get it registered just because you want to. Mm -hmm. You have to show them, hey... I'm using this in commerce. So Facebook probably was able to show, hey, we have a subsidiary probably called Face, or people often uh, refer to Facebook in slang terms as, as face. face. But okay. either way it goes, we're using this term in commerce, meaning they're making money or they're holding some type of product or service out for, for, you know, for payment, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how it works. So they mm -hmm. were able to show the USPTO, hey, I meet the requirements, and that's how they got it registered. That is yeah. wild because I think who, who I think LeBron tried to register Taco Tuesday. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but he didn't get that one, right? Uh, yeah. I think it was already somebody registered. already registered, and they basically, um, um, I think he got in some a little bit of trouble, cease and desist or something, but he couldn't use it. So he made like a funny commercial, like I can't say this anymore. Yeah, you know, I do remember that. Yeah, it was kind of cute. So it look, it gets look, it's like nuck if you buck when it comes to trademarks. The, it's it's downright. Yeah, that's crazy. And like the one that the thing that brought that whole idea up for me was I seen a video kind of talking about that idea where a lot of major corporations are in a rush. They're like in a competition in a sense to trademark a lot of these basic words that you wouldn't think, but that that lowers competition over overall. Like whenever you are saying it's cutthroat in this world, like. If you try to start a business that's just face, now you get in the cease and desist from Facebook, hey, you can't use that. But remember the rule. You own it in the in that particular category unless you can establish it's, it's some other loopholes. Like if you have a famous, uh, a, a known famous brand or something like that, then you can establish uh, ownership in other categories that you don't actually have a trademark. But the general rule is you only own it in that, in that category. Gotcha. Right? So, yeah, they own... Face, but let's say I'm assuming it's Facebook, so they probably own the trademark to face and education and entertainment, right? Um, somebody else, let's use cosmetics again. Somebody else might do face for cosmetics. Well, Facebook might not mess with them because that's not their industry. Got, that's not their category, right? So it, it boils down to that. And then it was something else you were talking about, uh, the influx of filers. Oh, yeah, filers. So during COVID, so I noticed the same thing. So so pre-COVID, it was like six months, maybe nine months, you know, the waiting time. But I feel like what happened is during COVID, 
you had attorneys like me really pushing the information on social media, trademark, trademark, trademark. So then you got an influx of more people becoming aware and taking action because now people sitting at home, they have the time. Thanks. They got the time. They got the information. They people getting their little money Stimmy, and stuff. And they got the resources. Right. They got the money, you know. Some and people so had the PPP. Yeah, so people just became more aware during that pandemic period, and so now everybody's like, I'm trademarking, I'm trademarking, right? I don't feel like it's enough people still because I still get people coming to me crying about issues with somebody else, you know, owning it, and they didn't get to file it in time and stuff. But uh, that's the deal. Yeah. People just had the time. If you go, <laughs> and it's one of those things we're talking about, the whole umbrella intellectual property. It's definitely a worthwhile investment in your business. Absolutely. Because it's like... You would hate for it to like you. You start your business. You start making some money because that was our mentality. Like, okay, we started the business. We making money. If we don't do this, I think O'Neill was the one that actually told us. O'Neill Parker, shout out to O'Neill. He's like, man, y'all better trademark y'all shit for somebody else. Go do that, Good and job. then and then y'all gonna be friend? sitting. It. Yeah, yeah, he was one of yeah. actually the first, first guest we ever had on the show. Need those kind of friends. He said he said y'all better trademark this shit before somebody go and try to use it or do something with it. And it's like it's. Yeah, what when you you're an attorney, you charge people to do this. It was like fifteen hundred to two thousand bucks usually on average. It could be more. Some something like that. Yeah, yeah depending on how many you're getting, right? Because mm-hmm. I think are we only in education and entertainment? I could have swore it was in another one too. I didn't see any other categories, yeah, and that, that was a problem for me. I was like, y'all, it's some other categories you guys need. Man, we're gonna, we're gonna talk, talk about, about yeah, that. Right? We're talk about <laughs> we ain't gonna tell y'all what we need, but we are gonna figure it out. Okay, yeah, that's good. Shit. It's, it's it's one more question I have on trademarks. Um, is there like an expiration period, or what is the maintenance of a trademark that that's you good. should uh, know about? Yeah, so it's not really like an expiration, but there are like um like deadlines. So you have five years, ten years. So the USPTO is not going to give you like an indefinite trademark. Mm-hmm. They're going to check in with you over time to see that you're still using it in the way that you got it, you know, that you got it registered for. Right. So you're still going to have those little deadlines. And so once you get it, your your stuff trademarked, your attorney, at least I do, they'll send you like a little uh, packet with your trademark, basically letting you know, hey, at at this marker, five year marker, we have to show proof again. Hey, we're still using it at the 10 10 year marker. We still have to show proof. Hey, we're still using it. So it's kind of like a check in if you will. And as long as you keep checking in and showing, Hey, I'm still using it. Then you can continue to maintain, maintain your ownership. Sorry, I'm talking all fast, but yeah, you you will continue to maintain your ownership over it. So that's it. Simple. And is it a fee for that, or you just literally have to go in there and be like, hey, I'm still using it? No, it's a fee for everything. So yeah, okay. shit. Ain't, <laughs> ain't nothing in this life free, huh? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so it's a fee for everything, yeah. But that's a good question. Okay. Okay, yeah. and uh, I had one more thing with trademarks before we move on okay. in the contract. You asked as many questions about trademarks. It was, I know, you you, you, you in your bag with this stuff. You say you love it. I can see it. <laughs> the passion is evident. Yeah. Um. No, but one of the things you and I had spoke about whenever we had Flex's event as well mm. uh, was with the whole situation situation with Tasha K and trademarks as an asset. Mm. I never once thought about it that way, right? Uh, whenever we were talking, uh, people that don't know Tasha K, she's like a, I guess, a blogger gossip, type, a gossip, gossip blogger. Uh, yeah. Well, she keep, getting, she keep getting sued for defamation of character, talking crazy about people. I think Kevin Hart just sued her as well. Oh, wow. I yeah. think he's intending to sue Yeah, her. like I, he, he threatened to sue her or something. Like I've seen some headline. Um, mm-hmm. because she like was trying to get money out of him to not release an interview. That's neither here nor there, right? Yeah. Um, but she got sued by Cardi B. She lost, and then she was saying she don't have no money to pay. So it kind of the, what you said earlier. You don't want to sue nobody with no money because right. then it's nothing. But you brought up a very interesting point when it came to the trademark. And the trademark is an asset that technically could be sued for. Like how how would that work? Yeah. So remember when we first started talking. We talked about the term intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So property. Mm -hmm. So you want to treat your intellectual property very similar to how you treat real property. So let's say this this entire building that we're in we're in right now, someone owns this, right? And so they can rent it out. They can tell people, no, you can't come in. They can stop people from using it. They can also sell it. And so whoever owns this building, let's say they get into some type of lawsuit, and then there's a huge judgment that they owe. Well, if I found out as an attorney that this is one of their assets, I can then, I'm a judgment creditor at that point. So then I can ask the court to force the sale of this asset to pay off the judgment that they owe me. 
And so your intellectual property is the same. It's an asset. So I don't know a whole lot about that 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 person, but if they have a, a large brand to the point where somebody someone might want to buy it, it might be worth forcing a sale of that intellectual property Dang, to so pay the judgment. Even if she don't want to sell it, I can force her to sell it. Any asset. So if you, that's why it's important not to lose a lawsuit. So if you lose a lawsuit and then there's a judgment against you, any assets that you have are on the hook. So whether that's real property, intellectual property, it doesn't matter. Cars. So think about it. When you're dealing with the IRS, for example, and you owe the IRS, what do they ask you? You own any cars? What do you own? You want to know all your assets. Yeah, yeah, so they will force the sale of it. So I seen a young lady on social media um, talking about the IRS doing this huge sale of stuff that they collected mm-hmm. from people, and it was like Rolex watches. It was all it's like iPhones. It was wow. a lot it's of like stuff. It's like the government uh, liquidation slash auction Yeah, stuff. so when they seize your property because you owe them, right? So it was all the way down to, like, people's iPhones. So it can get really petty if you wanted to. <laughs> When you're Think trying to enforce folders, a judgment. Man. <laughs> like, no. like, like, hey, damn, I need no. that too. Give it here. <laughs> yeah. So you, you can most definitely force the sale of someone's intellectual property. There's content. Hey, Siri, oh, stop listening. Sorry. Yeah, no, nah, but uh, that that's crazy. So you could actually, and in that case, like, obviously we don't know the value of her brand or if it's even trademark because I, I don't really know too much about it other than the fact that she keep getting sued for running off at the mouth. But whenever you shared it with me, I was like, yo, that's crazy. Like the I didn't know that that was a possibility that you could force people to sell their assets if in that type of situation. Yeah. Okay. So so any assets are are at risk when you when you have a creditor, when you have somebody coming after you because you owe something, right? Damn. So you just gotta keep that in mind. So Damn. right now you guys have a trademark. So you gotta you have to look at the trademark like this is my property, right? You can license it out. You can send cease and desist letters to tell people to stop using it. You can also sell it. So if there was a huge judgment or something, Lord forbid, then that's that's always a possibility. Okay. Um, I do have one more question with trademark. I wanted to talk about trademarking internationally. Because mm-hmm. right now we're talking about, you know, U.S. based. What is it like to trademark internationally to protect yourself as well? Yeah, so I've never done an international trademark. Mm-hmm. But the bigger brands, let's look at, like, say, Nike, stuff like that. Apple. That is, yeah, that's something that they do because they are international. And so, like, I think China is a big hub for it because a lot of people are over there doing things. But they have their own database similar to the USPTO, right? right. And so, like, if you were my client and you said, hey, Candace, we're expanding over to China and I want that protection. So then I would connect with counsel over in China and say, hey, yo, this is my client. We need this trademark done, and then we will get it done. Okay. So that's how it goes. Because you got to remember, every jurisdiction, when there's attorneys, you have to be allowed or approved and licensed to, to represent clients in that jurisdiction, right? So we want to make sure that you're not getting me in trouble because <laughs> I'm going over in China filing trademarks. So that's just a little bit of humor. But you just find an attorney in that uh, jurisdiction. I know Africa is really popular as well, like Ghana, Nigeria, uh, for the trademarks. For trademarks, that. yeah, for integrating with us in the U.S., like okay. working back and forth with, with clients and stuff like that. So it's possible, but you got to be strategic in the sense of where do I need to file my international trademark? Because, I mean, you can file it anywhere in the world, you know, right? But do you really need it over there? Yeah. You know? I got you. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So now I kind of want to get into contracts. This okay. has been a great conversation on trademarks. Y'all make sure y'all leave that rating and review because I know y'all got some value <laughs> out of that. You know what I'm saying? So kind of hopping into the contracts, Candace. Okay. Like one of the things that I always like to ask attorneys, like what's something, like what are some key terms or phrasing that you always look for whenever you're looking at business deals that people should watch out for? Like, you know, you're just looking at a contract. What's like immediate red flags for you as an attorney? It was a lot of them. Um, I know you guys were asking me earlier about uh, courses, or I think that was another guy, but um, I actually did a whole course on, on reviewing business contracts because so many people just look at the money. Oh, they're supposed to pay me X amount of dollars, and then they sign. Mm-hmm. So it's horrible, and I wish more people would start doing a proper review of their contracts because it would save them a lot of headaches, right? So me as an attorney, 
there's a, a few different things I'm always looking for. The first one is jurisdiction, right? Mm -hmm. So jurisdiction is going to always be like a county and a state, right? A city and a state. And that's important because if we do need to file a lawsuit for breach of contract, it's going to, that's the place where we have to file our lawsuit, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm your attorney and I'm licensed here in Texas, you guys are physically here in Dallas, Texas. If you do a deal with someone and they put Los Angeles, California as a jurisdiction, so then that's where we have to play ball if we have to handle a lawsuit or defend ourselves from a lawsuit. We have to go over to Los Angeles, California's court system, mm -hmm. right? So that puts us kind of at a disadvantage because mm -hmm. now, A, I'm going to have to go and find you an L.A. attorney or I'm going to have to get permission from L.A. to represent you on the case. And then, B, that's their home state advantage, right? So jurisdiction is always important because it's going to save you a little bit of money when it comes to attorney fees and things like that. And then the traveling and all, you know, all mm -hmm. that stuff that goes on with, with litigation. So that's really important. Um, another thing is what we like to call uh, a merger clause. Mm -hmm. And the merger clause is usually going to be at the very end of the contract. And it's basically saying that this contract is the complete agreement between us. So a lot of times when you're doing business, there's phone calls, there's emails, there's in-person conversations. Mm -hmm. And those conversations or communications Don't might matter. be different than what's in writing. So let's say we agree I'm going to sell you, you know, my puppy for $50 in person. But then I go home and something changes and we agree, no, I'm going to sell it to you for $20, right? So we have all these other external communications but when you have a merger clause it's saying none of that matters our complete agreement is what's right here in writing it's in black and white yeah so that's really important because a lot of times when it comes to uh, lawsuits and stuff like that mm -hmm. people will try to bring in those external conversations to try to prove what the actual agreement was supposed to be or what it is right and so then they'll start bringing in emails. No, in the email we said this amount or whatever. So if you don't have that merger clause, then you run the risk of having to fight over what the agreement was supposed to be, mm. right? So that's super important. Um, and then one of my other favorite one is is something called um, an indemnification clause. Mm -hmm. And that's important because it's basically – now, you can do it both ways. You can do it for uh, you do one for me, you indemnify me, I indemnify you. However, when I'm reviewing a contract, I'm always making sure whoever my client is doing business with, they are indemnifying my client, right? So what it means is they're saying if any third parties have any claims against you because of my wrongdoing, I will protect you, meaning I will cover your litigation costs, your attorney fees, all that stuff. So a good example would be like intellectual property. If someone is doing a deal with my client and let's say um, they have a logo or something, but they stole the logo. If third parties try to come against my client for using that logo in this business deal, then this person is going to indemnify my client and protect them, right? And handle the lawsuit costs, the attorney fees, right? Because it was their fault. It in the was first their place. fault, right? So any third party claims against my client, this other person in the contract is going to basically protect my client. So that's another good uh, uh, provision, just because you never know what 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 stuff that people are in. We don't know if they stole some type of intellectual property. We just don't know, right? Um, that's also really good in the logistics industry because when you're doing business in the logistics industry, what if one of the trailers are stolen or something like that, right? So you always, 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 just as a rule of thumb, you want to put the indemnification clause in just to fully protect yourself. So those are my top three that I'm always, always, always looking out for, but it's also so many. <laughs> like, <laughs> I appreciate yeah, it. Though. That's I that's learned really a few things with yeah. them, yeah, them three right there because – that's the one thing that I've learned about contracts over time is that, like, they're very flexible. At first, I used to think very binary about contracts. It's cut and dry. This It's like whatever you want to put in there, you can put in there. It's just about making sure you have people who actually know how to read those things. So, like, uh, I guess another question, follow up on that. What are some, like, legalese-type terms that you notice that are often used to kind of, like, disguise things from people who may not be privy? 
Mm. Yeah, and stuff like that. Um, anything that's like Latin based is going to be a disguise. And I say that because in America, uh, the law pretty much derived from like a, like a Latin origin. So Mm -hmm. in law school, we're always, you know, using the Latin phrases for different things. So it's a red flag. If you see anything, well, not a red flag per se, but it's just something you want to pay attention to. If you see anything that has like a Latin origin for the word or something like that, you want to take the time and say, wait a minute, you know, what does this mean? Right. Mm, That's good. And I'm glad you kind of talked about you can put anything into a contract. What are some tips that you give your clients for whenever they're negotiating contracts, right? Maybe they might not like these terms. Like, how can you say, okay, maybe we can negotiate, they take this away, but they still feel comfortable with getting this bill done? Yeah, it's it's always a give and take. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how severe the particular term that we don't want in there how severe it is the damage that it could possibly do to my client mm-hmm. so those are like some of the balancing factors that you know i'm, I'm talking through with Let's my just client say worst connect worst case scenario what would be like the most severe like oh you should not sign this so anything that's ambiguous is horrible so if it says something like um, at my discretion mm-hmm. like i get to change the price at my discretion that's that's a no-go mm-hmm. because you want to be as clear as possible on the terms of the agreement so that that way is no problems. So if you negotiate $500 an hour, then you expect to get $500 an hour for your services. But if it says, I will pay you $500 an hour at my discretion, Oh. Then that's bad. So I see a lot of that. Those, those, those you know, little like, modifiers. Yeah, those ambiguous terms, right? And so to the to the regular eye, the the non legal eye, people look over that. But me, I'm like, no, absolutely, we're not doing that. And so another good example for you, um, I had a client. She's really big in logistics, um, and she was doing a deal with a broker, but the broker's contract basically required her to list herself in the agreement as well, like as an individual, mm-hmm. as well as her social security number, even though she already had an LLC. To make her liable. Right. So that was a huge, like, we'll have to walk away from this deal mm-hmm. because the entire purpose of having an LLC is to shield yourself. So why would you knowingly insert yourself as an individual into the contract? Mm-hmm. So fortunately, we were able to negotiate it so that it was removed. But that's an example of like a, absolute no no we can't move forward with this agreement right Mm -hmm. so it's really really um based like on a on a case-by-case basis Mm because i see some pretty interesting things in there but like i said some of the consistent things is the ambiguity right the as my at my discretion at my will if i feel like it you know stuff like that (laughs) i need it to be like this is like you say in that merger clause too i think that's important what we said in this agreement is what's on this agreement, right. and this is what's going to be binding us here. Mm. And I'm trying to think about another question, contracts wise. I know we last time we discussed like a lot of the uh, with LLC partnerships, you know, articles of organization, those types of things. Oh, the operating agreement. We yeah. talked about the operating agreement. So that's really important as well. So when we create the legal entities the entity becomes pretty much an individual, right? It becomes a person, Mm -hmm. right? So that's how you have to, like, look at it. Um, That's why it has the EIN number. It's kind of like... It's social, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a person. That's how I look at it. So if I'm doing business with a person, the number one rule is we put our our agreement in writing. So the operating agreement is the contract between you and the company, Mm, right? Gotcha. So a lot of people overlook that step because a they don't know about it and b they just think it's not important but it's really important because if a lawsuit or something like that ever happened that's one of the documents that I'm asking for in my discovery I'm saying I want a copy of the the operating agreement because this is basically the operating agreement is like your internal regulation for your business yeah right? so it's going to tell me a lot about how things go so for example if somebody has like a slip and fall at a store Right. And then, you know, it's this whole defense that the, the, the store has. Well, uh, it's our policy that we only check the floor once every hour and she fell, you know, at this time, whatever. 
people get really crafty with defenses. So then the first thing I'm saying is, well, let me see the policy. Let me see the operating agreement. Let me see, uh, you know, like like all this stuff. Let me see your training manuals and things like that, right? But the operating agreement is the the first contract between you and your and your company, right? If the company gets dissolved, how does it get dissolved? Who gets paid first? Stuff like that. Creditors get paid first. And then when it comes to um, multiple members, that's where I see a lot of the, the disputes come in yeah. with, with, with not having the operating agreement. Because mm-hmm. if we have multiple owners of the company, well, if, if somebody decides, hey, I don't want to be a part of this anymore, then how do we go mm-hmm. about paying them out? Do we pay them anything when they're leaving? Are they allowed to um, get someone to replace them as an owner? Like, it's so many different things that kind of come up in people's mind, right? Mm -hmm. So to avoid any, like, confusion, the operating agreement lays out everything. It lays out if you're able to, you know, do some of those things I just mentioned. You had a question? Yeah, if if the operating agreement, if you don't do one, isn't it like the default thing you get is like the state's default operating agreement? Or the something Texas like Business Organizations Code, right? So the thing is, that's a vast code. It's large. So we don't, yeah. you wouldn't know whether or not it's a provision in there that's going to be for or against what you're trying to do. So that's why it's best to just draft your own operating agreement and you read it, all members of the company sign it. So you guys all know, like, this is the procedure that we're going to follow, right? This is what I'm entitled to. And then the operating agreement also solidifies um, your your liability, right? So we always have a provision there, in there that says, from the company, right? If it's Chantel Law, Chantel Law, I agree to indemnify Candace, right? I agree to protect Candace. She is not liable for any debts of the company, Right. So those are some of the things that most people don't really think through when they create the legal entity, but it's super important. Yeah, I love it. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I can I, see I, you guys, y'all here. Yeah, like, I, 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 got, yeah, I, I got a million and one questions, but I'm trying to stay, I'm trying to stay focused. What you got? <laughs> but, no, uh, I was going, we kind of getting on time. Yeah, so I, I really wanted to ask to the, her, like I wanted to jump back into what she was talking about earlier, whenever she said she did like 30K the first month opening her business. Okay, yeah. I yeah, kind of yeah. just wanted to get into the business side of things for mm-hmm. you. Were you doing this as a solo lawyer? Uh, like, what did that look like once you actually started to form your, you know, firm? Yeah. So when I first started, it, like, I was doing everything on my own, everything. And that's why I think mentors are so important because you model yourself after your mentor. Excuse me. So for me early on, my mentor did everything himself, mm-hmm. right? He didn't have a paralegal. He didn't have like a, a, someone answering the phone, but he he does crazy numbers, like crazy numbers. I mean, but he didn't have kids at that time. He wasn't married. So I guess he just had a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I did everything on my own initially. And then over time I was like, wait a minute, this is too much. Like I <laughs> I'm know. I'm living in the ghetto. I, <laughs> I, I, I ain't got to get a, I ain't get a job to work. Yeah, this I, I ain't like, build a, a business minute. to work 24 seven. Exactly. Know? So then I start outsourcing. Like, okay, I need some assistance, need the paralegals, um, all that good stuff. So it was, it was a process for me, but I definitely had to, to realize that, just because they're doing everything doesn't mm-hmm. mean I have to. Gotcha. So, but early on, I definitely was thugging it out. And, and it just was fun, hustling. Too. It was fun. And yeah. I got a question. So, like, with making this money, were you just doing, like, making contracts? Were you actually helping them dispute lawsuits? Like, what was that first businesses for you that helped you kind of build your foundation? Yeah, so early on, it was a lot of uh, entity formation. Gotcha. So, back then, people weren't. You know how nowadays people are just coming into the knowledge of trademarks? It was kind of like that when I first started my firm. People mm-hmm. were coming into the knowledge of, oh, I need an LLC or mm-hmm. a corporation. So I was getting, like, so many of those. And then on top of that, um, I would get some business owners who would uh, run into some type of personal injury issue, right? So they'll be like, hey, I got into a car accident, Candace, And because I'm the only attorney they know, even though it's from a business point, they would come to me for personal Mm -hmm. injury. So then I started getting into that a little bit as well. Um, And then it just took off. But yeah. Personal injury, pretty good money too. Personal injury is great money. I always see all them damn billboards. That's the biggest law category for sure in terms of like, I know in Louisiana, man, it's crazy. They they literally had to pass a law against like all them billboards. Really? Yeah, because like, you know, what's his name? Uh, Morris Bart was the name of the lawyer. You're getting a free promo on this one. Don't expect it again. Um, 
he had so many like back to back or something like that. I think it was like a, a ten mile stretch where it was yeah. just like from Baton just Ru- from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. Wow. Just his face on billboards, like personal injury law, personal injury law. So I know it's a huge category in law. It is. And she, I mean, we deal with it on the insurance side of things, on the justice yeah. side. So yeah, definitely, it's a bag over there. It's a bag. Of, it's a bag. A lot of places, but mm-hmm. law insurance. That's like the industries I'm noticing. You got to think about it. Some people are always hurting themselves, right? Whether it's a car accident, slip and fall, whether it's a dog bite while you're at somebody's house or whatever, people are always getting injured in some type of way. And so it's always money to be made, right? Especially if whoever the defendant is has insurance. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, it's a huge industry. So that's kind of how I started getting into it because people, you know, my business clients will come to me and be like, Candice, Miss Candice, I got into a car accident. What am I supposed to do, you know? And so I was like, well, let me kind of see what's going on here and check this out. And it's, it's pretty they simple. Had like a valid claim too. Like you yeah. know, you got it's not it's not like rocket science. If somebody hit you, they was at fault. You got hurt. Yeah, pay that man. Yeah, yeah pay that pay that pay that money. Yeah, that can be very straightforward. Um, did you have another? Mm, no, nah, I just was trying to figure out how it was for you in the beginning, starting oh. off your firm. Yeah, it was exciting. It was exciting. Um, Phone. I remember my phone was you know, after a couple of months. My phone was always ringing. Um, it just it just was real. How'd exciting. you manage it being a mom? I had a strict schedule, and I had to go back to kind of how I was in law school, right? So in law school, I told you we had we started off with seven classes. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked part time for the university's office of general counsel. Aside from that, I had my own clients. Um, they call it an Illinois 7-Eleven license where you get a, a license to practice law mm-hmm. under the supervision of another attorney. So I gotcha. had my own clients in Rockford, Illinois doing that. Was a mom, um, girlfriend, like all this stuff. And so I just had a tight schedule. I'm like, okay, I wake up at this time. I do this at this time. My baby's going to bed at this time, you know. And so I just, once I started my firm, I had to incorporate the same principles. And still do to this day. Like I have a... A tight tight. schedule. I'm doing this at this time, you know, um, and it's it's been helpful so far. Well, yeah, we, I'm sure you yeah. guys have tight schedules, right? I, like, <laughs> I ain't got no kids yet, but uh, yeah, we, we we stay we stay busy over here, you know. So yeah. rather we appreciate be, you taking some time out your tight schedule to come rock with yeah, us. Of course. Now, now Miss Business Lawyer, oh. we're gonna get into some of the the tail end of the podcast. Man, I need the next yeah, level you, you, up of questions, yeah, yeah. man. You you already saw saw what we some of the oh, questions man. though. So we about to do standing <laughs> on business. About those, okay. yeah, we about yeah, to do yeah. standing on business. Okay. So uh, I'll let you intro the segment, Jay. Uh, we're doing standing on business presented by the Private Small Business Society. The Private Small Business Society is focused on giving certifications to business owners um, and setting the standard for small business in America because there's no America without small businesses. Hey, Jake would be proud of me right now. Though. Yeah, I don't know, man. Where is he? He was in somewhere. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, I, I don't have the questions pulled up on my phone, but so yeah, I'm going to let you so, open the phone. So we're going to do five questions. We're going to okay. do rapid fire, and uh, let me make sure you can't see. Okay. I feel like you got this. I, I feel like you're a smarty. I feel like you're a smarty like, pants. <laughs> yeah, you know she graduated yeah. like Dean's list type of yeah, class. I feel, I feel like, like she's she going to she crush this one. I ain't going to lie. I was doing good on the questions you asked the other ones. I was over there like, yeah, C, A. <laughs> see, I, I, already, know, I, feel right. like, I feel like let's we, see, we, let's we see. need the next level yeah. up questions. Let, let's, right, let's start off slow. What does R R O I stand for in business? Return on investment. We don't need, oh the, we don't need the multiple choice for that one. Ding, 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 one on one. Let's go. Which of the following is an example of a tangible asset? Okay. A, brand reputation. B, employee skills. Or C, manufacturing equipment. I will repeat the question. Which of the five, yeah, is an example of a tangible asset? A, brand reputation. B, employee skills. Or C, manufacturing equipment. See. There you got it. Yeah. <laughs> she two for two. Let's see. What Yay. else we got? What else we I got? I thought she was gonna try to trip up with the other one. I was like employee skills. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Which of the following is a key component of effective marketing? Mm. A focusing mm-hmm. solely on traditional advertising. 
B, ignoring online marketing channels, or C, understanding and targeting the right audience? I think it's C, but wait, read it to me again. What was the question? <laughs> Which of the following is a key component of effective marketing? Key component. And mm-hmm. so A was? Focusing solely on traditional advertising. B, ignoring online marketing channels. Or C, understanding and targeting the right audience. I think it's C. Hey, Got to say it with your Three or three, oh. three or three, <laughs> let's go. C or A, but I'm like, A, that don't sound right. Okay. Okay. Four, question number four. What is the primary purpose of a business plan? A, to guide the operational strategy of a business. B, to keep track of employee performance. C, to calculate the exact profit margin. Or D, to monitor social media trends. Mm, A or C. Now read it again. <laughs> what was the question? Okay. What is the <laughs> primary purpose of a business plan? No business plan, okay. A, to guide the operational strategy of a business. And I'll read C for you again. To calculate the exact profit margin. No, it's A. A. Yeah. Four for four. four for like Wendy's, but better. See. You already know. <laughs> look, 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 look. Hey, she crushing it right now. She might be our first five for five standing on business. Like I said, we need the, we need the I next know, level I do, up, I do man. need a next level up. What does B2B stand for in business terminology? She know this. She like mm, business to business, <laughs> back to said, basics. Oh, <laughs> yeah, back oh. to basics. Business to buyer or born to build. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said Yo, who the fuck put that last <laughs> one? <in there? laughs> oh. It's a question. Born okay. to build. What does B two B stand for in business terminology? Okay. A. Business to business. B. Back to basics. C, business to buyer, or D, born to bill? It's definitely D, bro. Business to buyer. Oh, oh we got no, her. No, no, no. It's the first one. It's A. Yes, it's definitely That's what I said. It's We got her. <laughs> got him. Uh, four for four. Yeah. Standing on business. <laughs> I love it, this though. This was great, though. I love yeah. it. This was great. So listen, like y'all. This was brought to you again by the Private Small Business Society focused on educating business owners and professionals, professional development and certifications. Y'all tap the link in the show notes to learn more about it. If you like the standing on business segment, if you learn something every time, you know, uh, Miss Candace, she is a, a beast at when it comes to this goddamn trademarking and all this stuff. But I, you see, still, when it comes to these questions, some of these things is just basic business knowledge. So if you're one of them people that's like, you know, I've been able to build a business still. You can still find value Mm -hmm. in this. So y'all tap that down there. Check out the Private Small Business Society. Uh, I think it's a lot of different levels. And if y'all haven't already listened to our episode with Jake, uh, get more information on that. All righty. All right. Now, to get into our last little questions for you, Candice. We're going to keep holding. We're going to keep holding you. Uh, We got our last little little rapid fire that we like to get off. Uh, So I want to ask you the question that I ask everybody. Um, what is a financial tip or principle that you live by that you like to share with our audience? Oh, I like that question. Um, for me, my principle is multiple streams of income. Okay. Super simple. Uh, but I think that a lot of times people get, um, zoned in on, on their main income, whereas Mm -hmm. I like to kind of diversify, uh, even if it's something unrelated to law, at least I still have an income coming in. So for example, you know, yeah, extra cars sitting around, put them on two row, you know? Um, so stuff like that. So multiple streams of income. Okay. Mm-hmm. Second question. Are you frugal or are you a flexer? Both. <laughs> a I'm a frugal flexer. I was about to say exactly. she's a frugal flexer. People, people be thinking I spend a lot of money on the outfit or something. I'll be like, you you on, you'd be surprised where I got this from. I just make it look good. You just, a you just yeah, you make it look good. Yeah. I feel like I, I, I flex when I when it's something worthwhile. So for example, Hotels. Mm-hmm. I'm not staying at a raggedy hotel. It it, it got to be a five star. So. That's I understand. Damn. I feel you on that. You yeah. know what yeah. I can't do on hotels? I ain't a five star nigga. I ain't gonna try to act like that. But uh, <laughs> like outdoor hallways, right. I can't do hotels. Oh, outdoor no. hallways. Like a hotel looking. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting set up. Wow. <laughs> like somebody about to come rob me. No, nah, I can't do that. Yeah, no, nah, we're not doing nah, that. Fuck that. Uh, <laughs> last question: Do you have life insurance? I do. I got a few of them. Yep. Okay, she got a few of them. Hey, I love it. Everybody be have been having life insurance lately. Yeah. Hey, if y'all don't have it, make sure y'all get it. Protect yourself. Or, it's Candace. Or we coming and get y'all. 
though. I don't know about that. I'm not coming to get y'all. I'll let David handle that. <laughs> <laughs> but Miss Candace, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. This was a fun show. Um, could you please let the people know where can they follow you? Where can they uh? Access, in, yeah. They want to get the legal services, you know. What all I'm of saying? that, yeah. So all of my social medias are uh, Attorney Candice, and then as far as if you want to contact my law firm, you can call us at 844-480-0480. and then you'll just call. You'll talk to uh, one of my assistants, and just let us know what you need, and then we'll get back in touch and help you out. And that's that's in Texas, right? In Texas, real businesses. But I, I represent real uh, business owners throughout the U.S. So when okay. it comes to contracts, trademarks, remember trademarks are federal contracts, trademarks, um, formation of legal entities. I got clients throughout the U.S. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, again, Candace, sure I appreciate it, y'all. Make sure y'all Thanks get with her. Me. Y'all value this information. Y'all know what y'all got to do for me. Don't be a hoe. Leave <laughs> a five star rating. Leave a review. Share this with somebody who is building a business who needs this information. Candace, again, got to say thank you. And, uh, Jay, you got anything else for the nah, people? Nah, man, I ain't got nothing else. Uh, y'all just stay tapped in for what we got for the rest of this year. Uh, we're going to have some excitement going on. Yeah, we might be coming to a city near you. So if you want to see us in a city near you, yeah, y'all I mean, make sure y'all stay tuned in to us on Instagram. Yeah. And shoot us an email, DM. We're trying to gauge interest, see what we're going to hit. Um, yeah. but Respond to the email when yeah. you get it. Respond yeah, yeah, yeah. to the surveys, all of that. We need that. Well, until seeing, next time, family. Stop having doubts. And what's the point of having clout? Yeah. Can't cash it out. Yeah.